That's good. Uh, I'm not going to keep you too long tonight, but I always begin with a little talk on leadership because many times we take our leaders for granted. And, uh, and, and really, it's, it, it speaks volumes when somebody takes you for granted. It's actually a compliment. Uh, we don't like it, but it says that you're dependable. It says that you are reliable, you're constant, you're consistent. You're so much a part of the fabric of success that we no longer even sense your presence. It's really something. You can't take everybody for granted. I mean, some people, you have to micromanage, you have to watch them and look very carefully to make sure that they don't ruin your stuff. Amen. But anytime you go to a church and it's peaceful and it's organized and it's going forward, you ought to give God thanks for that leader every day. Amen. 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 Uh, you know, sometimes we don't know the value of what we have until we lose it. And then when it's gone, we find uh, Bishop, uh, the late Bishop Arthur Brazier. I went to his funeral and before he died, I went to visit him because uh, he took me in some 30 years ago and even though he was 30 years older than I, I, I hung with him all the time. And as we were talking, he said, I said to him, I said, it seems uh, very tragic that none of us is indispensable. And the old man said to me, as he was sitting there grappling with his own mortality, he said to me, Noel, none of us is indispensable but some of us are irreplaceable. And that was quite a statement uh, that touched me deeply in my heart because you have some men around here and women around here that are irreplaceable. And I think we ought to extol the virtue of the gifts that God has given us and we ought to thank God for gifted men and gifted women because the truth of the matter is Whenever you're gifted, that gift is not for you. That gift is for somebody else. And when you end up with a lot of haters, when, when, when people hate because of your gift, they're really not criminal. They're just crazy. Because after you have killed somebody that's gifted, you can't get their gift. The only way to enjoy the gift is to keep the person alive. Amen. Amen. Your character is yours, but your gift belongs to somebody else. And as I go forward, I'm going to say this. If you don't have any haters, you're not very gifted. Amen. Somebody's not going to like you because you're gifted. And don't take the negative negatively, take it positively and just operate your gift because you have it. Amen. Give God praise for yourself. Give God praise for your leaders. Amen. Can I, can I say just one other thing before I go further? Uh, nobody really extols the virtue of the creativity that goes into this job. On Saturdays, I don't know when past the study, I have to study all the time, but when sometimes this Bible with all of these pages on a Saturday night when you know you've got thousands of people to preach to the next day, sometimes it shrinks into a pamphlet. Am I the only one that has that problem? Or uh, sometimes the creative and the cognitive intellectuality that goes into this business is oftentimes missed by most of our members. They don't grasp the enormity and significance of being creative enough to speak to the same congregation every Sunday with a fresh word. Amen. Amen. It's not just a three point message that you all learned, it's being able to deal with a contemporary situation and circumstance and take a book that was written thousands of years ago, glean truth from it, 
have one foot in the problem, the other in the solution, and speak to everybody out of one voice and feel like he's only speaking to you. Nobody gives any consideration for what it takes these men and these women to put together a word. You know, if you're on the road, uh, all you need is as many messages as you go into one particular city. If I go seven times to Detroit, I only need seven messages and a good secretary to make sure that I don't preach in the other church what I preached in the other church. <laughs> Amen. But when you got to get up and preach to the same congregation every Sunday and, and, and you all are discriminating. You will get ready, you will wash your car, get one of those three, four hundred dollar hairdos, put on your Louis Vuitton, uh, Givenchy, Brioni, Anta, and you will go to the church, drive 20 minutes, 30 minutes to the church, pull up, and you don't see the pastor's car. And you may ask, is he here? And you will back that car out go back home or go to a church you wanted to visit because uh, that you didn't go to because the pastor was home. You are discriminating. You're discriminating because of the level of excellence that has been displayed, you don't want any less. But nobody gives any real credence to what goes into being able to preach to you every week. Anybody who preaches to you every Sunday, you ought to pray for every day. And you ought to give God thanks. You know, every now and then we take one, you know, we didn't quite get the homework together. And we take one and we tie it up with another one and we put a new subject to it. Amen. Then we get up and announce it. But the church folk take notes. Got your name written beside the scripture, the date you preached it, the subject you preached it. And some have the unmitigated gall and audacity to say you preached it better the first time. <laughs> give God praise for the creative energy that makes this thing work. Come on, give God just a, just a warm hearted praise for every one of these leaders and preachers. Amen. I brought some material and uh, uh, I have lots of good stuff at the table. Preaching 101, I've got that. I've got Jehovah Jireh. I've got all kinds of prophesying to the false prophets. Amen. I've got Credit Sunday School, Increasing and Improving Credit, Faithmate.com. But I want you to turn with me, and all that's at the table, but I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5. And I want to associate that with St. James uh, chapter 1. And I have some glasses somewhere. Uh, oh, here it is. There it is. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I thought about, I said now, they have a wonderful theme here. Great God, great vision, uh, great accomplishment, the revelation of God's glory. But I was so glad that you had a speaker to address that because that untied my hands and I thought that I would do nothing new. I was not going to come and, and try to navigate down some road I haven't been down before. Not with all of you out here, I'm not going to try to do that. Amen. So if you would go with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the peace with God is certainly different than the peace of God. Peace with God is the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary, where diakonos, just as if we have never sinned. It is not that we did anything to merit it. It's simply that when God looks through the blood of Christ Jesus, we look white. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as wool. When he looks through the blood of Christ Jesus, we look white. When he looks around the blood, we're still scarlet. I was flying to Africa the other day with uh, Bishop Jakes and a few others. 
I was doing something there and I wanted to be unnoticed in the night as I was reaching for my Dr. Dre uh, headphones and I have this little red light that I look in the dark for things. And it's interesting, I just didn't want to, you know, everybody else trying to sleep, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and as I look through the red light and turn the headset on, it has a little red light. And the red light that I was looking at it through caused the other red light to look white. When I removed the red light, it was red. The light didn't change. The light was still red, but when you look through red, it looks white. Peace with God has nothing to do with anything that we do. Peace with God comes simply by the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Now the peace of God is a process through sanctification through the Holy Spirit. Which means I can truthfully say that all of us have peace with God, but all of us have not yet achieved the peace of God. That's a process, all right? So now he continues and he says, uh, by whom also, that's by Jesus Christ our Lord, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I would read a little bit of James. Uh, chapter 1 beginning at verse 2 and it says my brethren count it all joy I'm trying to get there I don't think I got there yet when ye fall into divers temptations knowing this that the trying of your faith work at patience but let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of god that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him but let him ask in faith not wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the lord a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways I'm concerned uh, primarily about two words one patience and experience patience of course is from the Greek word hupomone and experience is from the Greek word dakamaza it is to remain under until there is an approval I just want you to look at somebody like you're angry with them and tell them I've been approved <laughs> now look at somebody like you love them and tell them I've been approved <laughs> tell somebody else you've been approved <laughs> now holla we are approved yeah. that's what I want to talk about the book of Romans is regarded in some circles as Paul's treatise or Paul's presentation of the gospel and somebody asked the question how can it be defined as the treatise of the gospel or his presentation of the gospel and my sister is here somewhere thank you Janet for dinner and not have the signature or the character of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How is it that it can be defined as the gospel when it doesn't deal with the historicity of Jesus, it doesn't deal with the uniqueness of his birth, the uniqueness of his life, his teaching, the uniqueness of his death, burial, and resurrection, 
and yet still it is defined as Paul's presentation of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John show us and very definitely deal with Christ's humanity and what they show us is that he lived in a particular time in history in a particular geographic location and that makes him human because all of us will sojourn in a particular time in a particular place and yet still Jesus didn't go further than a hundred miles from where he was born but the uniqueness of his presentation leaves something out in the Gospels when we see the Gospels we get the historical presentation but we don't get the theological philosophy that surrounds what happened when he sojourned and so it is Paul now who breaks us into the philosophical theology that surrounds sanctification, propitiation, redemption, adoption, and of course justification. We don't see that, but we don't get those definitions in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Paul's presentation of the gospel goes behind the scenes of the historical presentation and gives us the philosophical so that we believe Jesus to get in here, but we know him to stay. It's one thing to believe him based on the record. It's another thing to have the theology that gives you the strength to hold on in difficult times. He opens up uh, in chapter one and what Paul does in chapter one is he turns one barrel of the shotgun against mankind in general. And what he says is that when man should have received and uh, been grateful, he refused to retain God in his own knowledge. And because he refuses to retain God in his own knowledge, God says, all right, you want to put me on trial, then I tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a mind that can't try anything. Ooh. Oh, yes. Uh, I told you a while ago, when people are sinful, it's not just because they're criminal. It's because they're crazy. Because God gave a mind that was trialless because man decided that he wanted to put God on trial to see whether or not he wanted to deal with him. Uh, do I have just a little time? Uh, do I have a little time? Uh, it, it's critical here because man chose not to retain God within the parameters of his own thinking. And that, of course, is because of free will. God gave free will. And to give free will, what God has to do is reduce his omnipotence to allow the creature in his space to have any choices that God himself uh, might or might not like. Uh, it's a critical piece because he puts the man, he, he lowers, yes, he lessens his omnipotence, allows the man to make choices, and he puts himself on the shelf to see whether or not the man would choose him. Uh, now notice now how in, in theology is called divine self-effacement where God reduces himself to the point where he will allow the creature the right or to choose him. If the creature is not allowed to put him up for choice, then he does not have free will because free will must also include the creature's ability to choose or not to choose the creator. But you cannot not choose the creator and expect things to go on as if you did. Because if God is not a part of your choices, then what you have done is just eliminated the substratum of all of your intellectual capacity and ability. 
anytime you refuse to choose God, things can't follow you as if God is with you. Uh, uh, something's pushing me here, you know. Uh, I can do that anytime. I can do that anytime. Uh, that's not the anointing. That's just me. All right. So don't, don't worry about it. I, uh, it's, it's a critical piece here because uh, uh, what man does is man wants to enjoy the freedom to choose. And if he chooses and God is not a part of the choice, then God does not have to send any extra chastening uh, the man will automatically be chastened by his own choices uh, I don't get your chastening and you don't get my chastening because my chastening is predicated on what I choose to do now when man chose not to have God and retain God in his mind what happens now is that his mind becomes so trialless that he can't even understand the significance of the opposite sex uh, when a man is running his hand through the hair of another man and running his hand down the back of another man and running his hand down the legs of another man he's not criminal he's just <sighs> because he chose not to retain God in his knowledge God gave him over to a mind that cannot figure out what to do uh, can, can I, can I uh, uh, now, now we want the choices we, we want the choices but we, we don't want the consequence of our choices we want to choose uh, now, 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 now because God, because he, he decreased or uh, because he divinely self-effaced as it relates to his omnipotence he did not reduce his omniscience which means that he knows what we're going to choose before we choose it but if every time we chose something that he didn't approve of and he interfered then we would not have free will free will necessitates that I can choose whatever I want to choose but the problem is I have to live with the consequences now we use that against God we do it all the time and we say something like you know well Lord if you knew that man was going to treat me like he did you should have never let me choose him uh -huh, uh -huh. Lord you know if that woman was going to treat me like that you should have never let me choose her how could you let me make that choice well when mama told you to leave the man alone that was God uh, when your best friends told you to leave the man alone that was God when the woman he was with told you you don't need him that was God and when the man himself said now baby you don't need to mess with me uh -huh, that was God but you had to have him and so now you got to leave uh, I wish somebody to help me uh, at chapter number two he turns the second barrel of the shotgun against the Jewish people he said now you had the Pentateuch you had the Torah you had the law you had the pillar of cloud by day the pillar of fire by night and you wouldn't serve God by chapter number three he proves that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in chapter 4 he picks up with justification and he points out that we cannot justify ourselves no more than Abraham can have a child at a hundred and Sarah at 90 just as that is a 
double impossibility so it is that you and I cannot justify ourselves because indeed and in fact our trialless mind was so reprobate that we didn't even choose to come to God independent of him drawing us uh -huh. we're here because we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world and we could make that choice unless he first sorrow or dragged us it would seem then that according to the issue of justification and that's where we're going now that it would be an easy ride and it would be just you know we just slip right in and just make it through uh, without any difficulties uh, but the truth of the matter is that God has to raise us to bring us from what we used to be and how we used to think to the way that he wants us to think you see we were processed and we were socialized in a negative environment and our proclivity and tendency is to operate within the parameters of the environment that we were socialized in uh, I mean, uh, uh, the first words that God uh, spoke to Abraham he, he said to Abraham he said one I want you to leave your father's house I want you to leave the place of your birth I want you to leave your country I want you to leave your land essentially not in that order he started with leave your land it was uh, uh, it was Karl Marx that said that land ownership is the substratum of wealth and stability and God said to Abraham I want you to leave your land I don't want you when you walk with me to associate anything material as your strength for being with me I want you to leave your land then he said to him I want you to leave the place of your birth it's Spinoza who said that we are the pool what our pool is the genetic pool we draw from is what we become and what God is saying now I want to socialize you differently because of the blood of Jesus I don't care what's running in your blood when I run in your blood you're going to be different than what your mama's 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 father's father's father used to be then he said I want you to leave your father's house because Sigmund Freud said we are no better than the way we were developed in our early childhood and so what God is saying now is I need you to change your mindset and that's why there is a process to bring us from one level of life to the next level and it all begins with the transformation of our mind I want to bless you I want to take you to another level but you have to be able to make the leap from the way you were socialized the way you were brought up and where I want to take you you've got to be able to move from the halt the lame the crippled the blind into a space that I want to take you and so the question then becomes will thou be made whole and the answer is I'm about to heal somebody in here but I'm only going to heal one somebody by this pool I don't want to waste my healing so I want to know are you ready to take the step from the way that you were socialized the way that you were brought up from the way that you were manipulated and orchestrated by those who were around you are you ready now to make the quantum leap to be where I would have you to go and in order for that to happen you just can't walk in and walk straight into the mindset that God would have you to have and so he points out now that there is a relationship between tribulation and the stability of the Christian's walk and that's why I borrowed James a little bit because what James is saying is that there is a relationship between tribulation and the stability of a child of God's walk 
if I don't have to face any tribulation, then I will not develop as an individual. But in a love relationship where there is tribulation, it oftentimes questions my credulity and my credibility and veracity as it relates to my God. He loves me, and if he loves me then, why do I have to go through anything? Why should I have to face difficulties of life? Because anytime we think about love, we think about being protected. We think about being covered in a manner where we don't have to go through anything. I mean, if you love me, why would you allow me any kind of pain at all? But it seems here as if there's a proper way to handle trials and there is an improper way to handle trials. And I speak this everywhere because it's important for us to understand, particularly with the economic situation in our country, that we have to handle trials properly. The proper way to handle trials, as James put it to us in verses 2 through 4, is count it all joy uh, when you enter into divers temptations. Now he's dealing with temptations and he calls it divers and what that simply means from the Greek is it's variegated, it's round trials, it's square trials, it's rectangular trials, it's, it's, it's polka dot trials, it's paisley trials and, and it's not something that you thought through. You're not always the initiator of what you have to go through. Sometimes you got to go through stuff just because you were in somebody else's space and you had to deal with the collateral damage of the way they operated. And next thing you know, you are in a storm over who you are with. Uh, sometimes people put you through hell just because they want to. <laughs> Uh, and some people do it through carelessness and some people do it through uh, their own malicious disposition and attitude. Uh, sometimes you have been put through trials just because of the home you were born in. Uh, you didn't determine who your parents were and before you know it you're being developed socially in a psychologically debilitated arena that affects your life later because you just came up in the wrong home and you had nothing to do with it. He said the proper way to handle that is to count it all joy. And the reason you count it all joy is because your maturity level has taken you out of the situation into the results of the situation. In other words, I'm looking at an horrific situation, but I have projected my spirit out of the situation into a place of revelation as to what this situation is going to make out of me. Uh, I'm not going to have the same kind of mechanism that did the choosing that got me into trouble because I've entered into diverse temptations and I've been whipped enough to know that I don't need to rush into making any decision about anything that's going to be life affected because of the temptations and the trials I have faced. I've learned to slow down and make sure that I've included God in the process of my decision making. And so he says, count it all joy because it's building your character. I have allowed it to come into your space so that I can make you strong enough not to be in a hurry about anything, but rather to be cool enough to know that if God is not in it, then I don't want to be a part of it anyway. <laughs> I wish I knew that years ago because I wouldn't have stumped my toes and I wouldn't have lost my mind 
had I understood that the trials around me are not there to destroy me, but rather to make me better. Oh God, no, no, hey, you can't just take my time because I'm not going to be too long. It's critical now because I never saw the association between double-mindedness and trials. Uh, I never understood that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God. Uh, he's saying that you cannot not walk with God positively because you're going through some stuff right now. He says now you've got to have enough wisdom to understand that what it is you're going through is being orchestrated, manipulated, and controlled by God. It is God forming you in the middle of something you regard as negative. And you, sometimes God has to push you to the very edge of your mind in order for you to change your mind. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but you see, you see, sometimes I walk outside of the principles of God. And when you walk outside of the principles, then you need miracles. Uh, can, can, I, can I say it another way? The more you walk in principle, the less you need miracle. Uh, the problem we need so many miracles is because we don't walk according to principle. Uh -huh. And I, can I take it further? The only time I am nervous about my enemies is when I'm not walking walking according to principle because if I'm walking according to principle there is nothing my enemies can do with me oh yes 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 because when I'm walking according to principle if my enemy gets into the hedge that's because God has ordained a situation for revelation uh, can, can, can I say that again when I'm walking into principle the enemy can't get to me uh, you see it was as much a miracle for Job to get in trouble as it was for us to get out of trouble why because Job is walking in principle and as long as he's walking in principle it will take a miracle for the enemy to get in the miracle was that God removed the hedge and he removed the hedge in order to give Job a revelatory experience that he couldn't have had if he was sequestered in the hedge. Let me put another way. Uh, can, 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 can I work just a minute? Uh -huh. We're we going to shout after a while, but I got to work. I got to have something to shout about. Now, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is a friend of Lazarus. He's a friend of Martha, and he's a friend of Mary. And they're friends. And John, in chapter 11, allow me the digression, uh, in chapter 11, uh, spends the first six verses trying to show us just how close Jesus was to this family and yet still when they were sick and the word was sent to Jesus uh, he just didn't go you know can I talk a little bit uh, pastors uh, let me talk pastors now, now most of us who who have churches of, of, of God smiled on us we got a few members uh, we generally have a staff of ministers who go to visit the sick and, and you know they go to visit the sick and I, I look at it as uh, here I am the body of an octopus and all of the people who serve with me are my tentacles and so you send somebody over to visit one of your members and, and they go over there and the first thing they ask is did the pastor call you uh, come on man the reason I sent you over there is to represent me 
Now, why are you going over there starting some stuff, uh, asking the sick that I call? You are my phone call. You, you represent my visit. You know how it is when people don't respond, when leaders don't respond when people are sick. Uh, that's why Martha said, if you had been here, uh, my brother would not have died. Wrong, wrong, wrong. I have allowed the enemy in the hedge because I only give revelation to my friends. I don't give revelation to my enemies. I only give revelation to my friends. And I chose you so that I might reveal to the world that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth on me shall never die. So I had to create a situation in order to give you a revelation. He created a situation for revelation and called it Jehovah Jireh. He created a situation for revelation and called it Jehovah Rofika. He created a situation for revelation and called it Jehovah Rava. He created a situation for revelation and called it Jehovah Sikanu. And he's creating a situation for revelation in your life. And he says, when I create the situation, count it all joy because I'm getting ready to take you to another level. Uh, I feel like preaching. I'm going to tell you, touch your neighbor seven times. That's it. Uh, I'm not barring one yet. Uh, the trials then must be approached with joy based on the realization of what the trial is going to make you. Uh, you want to be anointed, but you're not just going to rub on somebody that's anointed and end up anointed. Uh, you're going to have to go through some. Uh, you're going to have to be broken a few times, just, just, just broken and just broken. If I break you twice, you can only feed two people. If I break you three times, you can touch three. If I break you 40 times, you can touch 40. Well, some of us had to be broken a few thousand times in our lives so that we might touch people of all sizes, of all types, of all kinds. So when I'm being broken, I must give God praise because he doesn't break until he blesses. He has to bless you so you can take the breaking so he can distribute you to many different people. So instead of complaining while you're going through, he says, count it all joy. Oh, I feel like preaching here. Uh, where am I, Patrick? Uh, uh, all right, good. Uh, it's, it's critical here because it leads to patience. Uh, Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. We got work to do. Uh, and, and, leads, and patience completes us. It, it, it takes the edge off of being a, in a hurry about anything. So that's now why he says we glory in tribulations also. Because Satan, you're bringing it on thinking you're going to destroy me. But what you're going to end up doing is making me better. I will not be bitter, but I will be better better and that's why I give God praise for all of my enemies because my enemies get me blessed uh, my enemies help to move me to the next level my enemies help to uncover the weaknesses that I have so that God can fortify the weaknesses because of my cognitive involvement in the move of God Oh, God, give God thanks for your enemies. Uh, your enemies just help you to find out who ought to be 
in your space and who ought to be eliminated from your space uh, that's what tribulation does all trials do is help me to distinguish who is who in my space uh, now you need to be reduced you need to be increased you need to be moved over there you need to go over there uh, when I was going through something you left me to go through by myself um, you were with me on the Mount of Transfiguration but you couldn't hang with me in Gethsemane now you were there when it was time for praise uh, but you didn't know when I lost my house you know when I bought it when we had the party but you didn't know when I lost it oh I didn't know you were going through all that uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, all tribulation does is help you to figure out who needs to be around you and who needs to be gone uh, that's all it does it helps you to figure out who your friends are and who your enemies are you know sometimes you have people around you that really get envious when you're blessed uh, as long as you complaining about uh, what's going on in your life oh let's go to lunch but let somebody call you and ask you how you doing oh I'm doing fine all right see you later you want to go to lunch when I'm hurting uh, but you see me later when I'm doing all right I wish somebody to help me here oh God it's critical because he says I want you now to glory uh, catch your my and it, it really means to glory on account of a thing that is exalt because of something because God moves you to next levels in very scandalous uh, scandalizing uh, from the Greek where Paul says the preaching of the gospel is scandal uh, offender in the Latin a very offensive where Jesus says blessed is the man who is not offended in me and it's easy to get offended when your expectation and your experience don't come together uh -huh. that's when you go double minded because I'm expecting something but I'm experiencing something else uh -huh. the prophet should have told us that we were going to experience financial decline in America and because we didn't get the right word we were not equipped to handle having to downsize I wish somebody would help me but the truth of the matter is the tribulation will prove whether you're real or your memorex uh, I may lose my house but I'm not gonna lose my mind uh, I may lose my job but I'm not gonna lose my mind because I'm gonna need my mind for the next job uh, 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 mm, because you lose a man don't mean you ought to lose your mind because uh, you're gonna need your mind for the next man because uh, I lost a woman don't mean I'm gonna lose my mind uh -huh. and I got news for you give somebody a high five for the first time and say neighbor never say you have lost everything because a child of God cannot lose everything as long as I got God I'm ahead of myself here uh, y'all sit down y'all y'all sit down uh, I, I i gotta remember where i am uh, it's 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 you could glory in the thing uh, you gotta glory and and, and and exalt him because you know where it's going uh, notice how god operates he chooses joseph and he says to joseph what i need you to do is i want to make you second man in egypt and i want to make you second man in Egypt and the question is why because of Egypt no I want to make you second man in Egypt because I want you to cover Israel well who is Israel Israel are the sons of Jacob well who are the sons of Jacob uh, Joseph's brothers but what did Joseph's brothers do 
sold him as a slave after contemplating killing him. Now his assignment is to cover his brothers. But his brothers sold him into slavery. Now if Joseph couldn't understand the significance of the tribulation, it would have made him bitter and not better. Had he been bitter, he would have blown his assignment because he would have used his power to destroy the brothers that sold him into slavery. I wish you'd understand it. But instead, he looks at his brothers from a lofty position that they helped to create. Because had they not treated him like that, he wouldn't have been where he became. So now he looks at them and instead of being angry, he simply says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So I'm not going to sit here and let my enemies feel like I'm dead. The devil is a liar. Come on, devil, do what you want. Because at the end of the day, God's going to use everything you throw at me to make me what he wants me to be. I feel something pushing me here. When you understand this, the article here in tribulation, uh, you all sit down, we, we can work a little bit. Uh, uh, it's coming. Uh, uh, pressing together. It's, it's a pressing together. It's an oppression. It's an affliction. It's distress. And the article suggests, and the article, yes, suggests that this is natural. Uh, Peter helps us with that when he says, think it not strange. Don't think it foreign. Don't think it's outside of the operation of God when you're going through something. It's God ordained. Because when he's not working on things around you, he's working on you. And at the end of the day, it's not what you have. It's who you are. I am who I am in a Bentley. But I am who I am on a bicycle. I am who I am in a Brioni suit. But I am who I am in a jogging suit. You see, God will use the things in order to make me what he wants me to be. Because at the end of the day, he's not coming back for my house. He's coming back for me. And if he's got to take losing my house, in order to make me what he wants me to be then he'll do just that I feel it here and when I know how I'm coming out and I know how much better I'll be I praise God for the new me that the trials and the tribulations are bringing there is always a separation between my anointing and my appointing and I've got to learn how to operate wisely when I am the anointed one but somebody else is appointed David learned how to be the second man in a first position you've got to understand how to navigate when you are under even though you've been anointed to be over don't lose your mind while you're under because you have been anointed to be over. I feel something. Give somebody a high five, number two. And say, neighbor, act wisely. Uh -huh. Give God praise while you're going through it. Because you know where it's coming out. At the end of the day, this will not kill me. This will make me better. And I'm praising God already for what he's going to use me to do after I come through this trial I'm praising him for the revelation I already have after I come through what the devil thinks is going to destroy can I take it further oh God I feel I feel something coming on now uh, Denny says this and I quote he said it does not simply mean when we are in tribulations uh, 
but also because we are so the tribulation becomes the ground of glorying unquote now here's where the Holy Ghost kicks in because my next level the exaltation it is not in the tribulation themselves but the beneficial nature that comes out of them it's because God has chastened me and now I'm seeing the effects of the chastening and that is I've learned how to call on him better I've learned how to feel his presence better I've learned how to in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct my path I've learned how to stay before him because his power now moves in a greater way and I understand that there is a certain anointing that comes when I'm going through something that I can't find when I'm not I wish somebody would understand me there's a level of comfort and consolation that he brings into my spirit when I'm going through a horrendous circumstance and I love it so much until I'm crying out to him Lord what else do I have to go through so that I can feel your presence in a way I felt it when everything was going crazy on the outside Lord what else do I have to go through that will increase my worship that I can lift up and enjoy your name even though I'm flat broke I'm enjoying you with a wealth that's coming out of the depth of my soul and I'm reaching for you in a manner that I've never reached to you before so I'm praising him for the condition I'm praising him for the situation because I'm not walking by situation I'm walking by revelation that no matter how rough it is I'm coming out with a mighty hand oh yeah so now it produces something then and the writer says what it accomplishes is hupamone and hupamone is a steadfastness it's a constancy it's an endurance one of the etymologists put it like this and I quote the characteristic of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety even by the greatest sufferings can I preach like I feel it uh, my brother was up here earlier and I heard him preaching in the midst of a painful situation and as he was preaching I noted that he didn't swerve from his purpose but he held on to the truth of God even though he was going through losing his mother can I talk to you a little bit you've got to learn to stay focused in light of your calling and whatever your purpose is you got to let the devil know I might be hurting but I'm still focused I might be talked about but I'm still focused I might be mistreated but that ain't gonna stop nothing I might be looked at as I'm least but that ain't gonna stop me cuz I know my purpose and I know my destiny and it doesn't matter what you throw at me I'm still going to be here doing the will of God I might be crying but I'm still moving I might be hurting but I'm still praising I might be down and out but I made up my mind that I'm going to hold on to the purpose that God has placed in my life we might as well have church come on Pat I'm tired of lecturing I feel like having just a little church give somebody a high five for the third time and say hoopamone you got to remain under if it's causing you to get closer to the Lord don't try to jump out of it just stay there till God gets through with his work don't run from it don't run out of it just hold on to the Lord begins to move you to the next level give some money high five for the fourth time and say neighbor you can't go back to Egypt you 
got to keep going forward. You got to keep moving to the next level. You can't go back to Egypt. You got to get by bitter water. You got to get by the Amalekites at Rephidim. You got to get by everybody at Jordan. You got to keep moving through Ahai. You got to get through till you get to the river and you can't turn back. I don't care how rough it is in front of you. That's where you got to go. So you can't keep crying every time you run into a situation that I want to go back to Egypt. Ain't nothing back there. God's taking you from slavery and he's moving you to ownership. And if it remains hoopamone, I'm going to stay in this wilderness till God brings me to the promised land. I'd rather be free with trials than to be somebody's slave making bricks. I feel like preaching in here. Touch somebody beside you and say keep going forward because you've got to get over these hurdles in order to become all that God has called you to be. So I got to hope on money. I got to stay under it. I know folk don't like the new direction, but you got to hope on money. You got to stay there with it until you overcome every opposition in your spirit. I feel some pushing me right about now. And hope on money turns to Dr. Mazo. And I might as well close this now because I feel church coming on. I feel something getting ready to happen up in this house. Give somebody a high five for the second to the last time and say, neighbor, I've got to hang in there. i got to hold on because I feel the next level is about to take place. I'm one pain away from my victory. I'm one tear away from my deliverance. I'm one heartache away from being who God has called me to be. I'm one, I'm one, just one. Can I preach like I feel it? Now Hopamone leads to Dakamazo and Dakamazo means to go through a series of events to see whether or not they can stamp an approval on you. I don't know what you drive but I know every car has a guarantee on it. It's been approved for a certain amount of miles. Well I can tell you they didn't guess when they said a hundred thousand miles. They froze the car in a cold place. Then they thawed it out. They drove it in the desert. Then they pulled the engine down. They checked the oil. Then they put it back together. They drove it back through the desert. Check the oil. Check and see the wear and tear on the Odin. Then they made some adjustments. Put it back together. Put it in a wind tunnel. Had the wind blow over it. Put some dummies in it and crashed it. Then put some dummies in it and let some crash it against the side. Then they tore it down. Put it back together. Then they put it back in and ran the test again. Well, I just come to tell you that I've been tore down. I've been driven in the rain, driven in the snow. Then the Lord pulled me down, checked my out, made some adjustments. Then he put me back in the wind tunnel. Had some dummies crash me on both sides. Then he pulled me back down, put me back together. Then he set me up. Then he put me in the snow, ran me in the rain. Then I crash. Then he pulled me back down. Then he put a stamp approved. 
I feel like preaching in here. Somebody, holla, I've been approved. I've been approved. Because I stayed there when I was talked about. Stayed there when I was walked on. Stayed there when they tried to kill me. So I've been approved for another level. Been approved for a fresh anointing. I've been approved for a bigger church. I've been approved for a bigger walk. I've been approved because I hung in there. Give somebody a high five for the last time. Said, neighbor, I stayed there when others would have left. I cried when others would have walked out. I could have left a long time ago, but I stayed there and I took it. I praised him when I was down. I praised him when I was hurt. I praised him when other people wouldn't praise him. I lift him up even when I'm sick. So devil, eat your heart out. I've been uprooted. I feel like preaching in here. I feel like lifting him up. Can I take a limit off of what I want to say? Can I take a limit off you touching your brother? Touch your own brother one more time and say, neighbor, I've been approved. I've been to hell and I hung in there. I've been walked on, but I hung in there. I've been talked about, but I hung in there. Now God has approved me for a fresh anointing. He's approved me for a bigger house, for a better car. And I can tell the devil, get out of my house. Get out of my house. Get out of my church. Get out of my choir. Because I have been approved. I'm getting ready to close. But I feel the Holy Ghost. Can I preach it like I want to? Give somebody a high five. Say, neighbor, have you ever heard of the three little pigs? One pig built his house out of straw. And the enemy came by. Said, little pig, little pig, let me in. Not on the hair of my chinny chin chin. I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. He did. Ran over to his brother. Blew his house down. But I'm so glad there was one brother that built his house out of rock. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. I've come to tell the church of God in Christ. One hundred and third convention. You have built your house out of rock. And I hear the devil sing, little pig, little church of God in Christ, sanctified, Holy Ghost, pig, let me in. I heard you say, not on the hill, of my Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, sanctified, church of God in Christ, chin, but he said, I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house down. When y'all moved from Memphis, came to St. Louis, he's huffing and he's puffing and you're still here. He's huffing and he's puffing and you're still holy. He's huffing and he's puffing and you're still lifting up the name of the Lord. I came to tell you, let him huff, let him puff, and I'll be praising the name of my God. Let him huff, let him puff, and I... I will lift up the name of my God. Give somebody a high five for the very last time. Say, neighbor. He's huffing, and I'm still here. He's puffing, and I'm still holding. He's huffing, and I'm still together. He's huffing, and I... Somebody holler, we are approved. We've been approved. For a Approved, a 
proof. We are approved for a higher. Because you hung in there in the face of your critics. You hung in there when they said it couldn't be done. You hoop a -mone. Didn't quit. Didn't turn your back on your vision. Went through hell. But the Lord said, you are approved. I'm approving you for the next level. I'm approving you for restoration of everything you've lost plus. I'm approving you to move now in an abundance you have never had because you knew how to remain under. And hope make it not a shame because it's not my love for God now but it's his love for me. Oh, I feel it in here for the love of God is shed abroad in my heart and he's not going to let me look bad after I've stood with him. The God we serve, we are not careful to answer you concerning this matter, O King. But the God we serve, knowledge says he's able. Oh, I feel it in here. This anointed place. Faith says he will. But commitment says, if not, we're still not going to bow. If he saves me out of your hand, I wouldn't lose. If I die where I'm standing, I still won't lose. Should I say that again? If he delivers me, I won't lose. But if I die making this stand, I still won't lose. Oh, King, you already defeated. Because the only way I can lose is if I bow. It's the only way I can lose is if I bow. I don't know what the outcome is, but I ain't bow. Ooh, I feel it here and because you took that stand God has approved you check through take somebody's hand if you would all over this building just come to tell you you've been approved Hallelujah. to your great great leader God just told me to tell him you've been approved yeah yeah that shot Woo! Approve. Smiling at your sacrifice. Smiling at your tears. And to that man, that woman, that person who walked away from ministry because of pressure. God said, come on back. When I called you and I gave you the gift to minister, I gave it to you before the foundation of the world. And when I gave it to you, I knew the mistake you would make because I had all the facts when I gave it to you. When I called you to preach, I had all the facts. The gifts and calling of God is without repentance. He won't have to take it back. Because when he gave it, he knew everything. What you did did not surprise God. He knew it before he gave you the gift. So now just get over it. You've been abused and talked about enough. Get over it. 
That's part of the penalty of. But now it's behind you. Get up, get back in your ministry. Get back in your purpose. And I promise you, you'll be better now because of that than you were before it happened. Touch somebody tenderly. The Bible says, what's of the things we bind on earth are bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. He was talking about the gospel. I want to accommodate the text and use it for prayer. Squeeze one hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bind doubt. I bind discouragement. I bind low self-esteem. I bind every negative thought. Every negative thought. Every I can't make it procrastinating, postponing spirit right now. I come against it. I, I come against it in the mighty hand. In the name of Jesus, I bind right now. I bind whisperers. I bind, I bind, I bind the broken heart. In the name of Jesus, I bind it right now. I bind manipulation. I come against that spirit now. I bind the spirit of failure. In the name of Jesus. Now squeeze the other hand. I lose joy. I lose a fresh anointing. I lose the next level thinking. I lose right now financial prosperity. I lose it in the name of Jesus. I lose creative ideas, creative thoughts, our cr creative songs, new messages, new sermons, new everything right now in the name of Jesus. And I claim it done. I claim it done. I receive my approval. I receive my certificate. I receive it in the name of Jesus. And I'm ready to move out, move up, move up and get it done in Jesus name. I'm going home to do it. I'm going home to accomplish it. I'm going home to reach it. I'm going home to declare it. I'm going home to move in it. And I speak it right now. Somebody loose your hands. Give God a celebration. Celebrate your approval. Celebrate your renewal. Celebrate your rejuvenation. Celebrate your anointing. Celebrate your wisdom. Celebrate your creativity. Somebody ought to celebrate who you are in Christ Jesus. Give him thanks. Give him praise. Lift him up.